afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Assemblyman Flores. Present. Assemblyman Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Chair Howdigy. Here. Thank you, Madam Sec Secretary. Please indicate all committee members are present. Welcome everyone tuning in over the internet. I would like to get started with just our normal housekeeping items. Please remember all exhibits, written testimony and amendments must be submitted by noon on the business day prior to the committee meeting. People who wish to provide testimony or attend the meeting virtually must pre-register online at the legislature's website. The public is strongly encouraged to submit written testimony in advance of the meeting by emailing the assembly email asmcl at asm.state.nv.us. Zoom chat is reserved for committee business only. Members, please remember to keep your camera on at all times. This will ensure that we have a quorum unless you are stepping away for non-committee related business. Members and presenters, please remember to be muted at all times and simply unmute yourself prior to speaking and then promptly mute yourself when you are done. Thank you everyone. And let's begin with our first agenda item. Our first item on the agenda is an introduction of a committee bill draft. BDR 53379 originated with the Legislative Committee on Senior Citizens, Veterans, and Adults with Special Needs, and was assigned to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor for committee introduction. The measure addresses that and certifies or provides that certain employees with the right to use sick leave to assist certain family members with medical needs. Remember that a vote in favor of introducing a bill draft does not imply a commitment to support the measure later pursuant to Assembly Standing Rule 57 sub 7. All this action does is allow the BDR to become a bill and then be referred to a committee for possible hearings. I will entertain a motion to introduce BDR 53-379. So moved, Madam Chair. I have a first by Vice Chair Carlton. Do I have a second? Assemblyman Flores, second. I have a second by Assemblyman Flores. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? <laughs> Assemblywoman Carlton. Yes. Assemblywoman Considine. Yes. Assemblywoman Dickman. Yes. Assemblywoman Duran. Yes. Assemblyman Flores. Yes. Assemblyman Frierson. Yes. Assemblywoman Hardy. Yes. Assemblywoman Kazama. Yes. Assemblywoman Martinez. Yes. Assemblywoman Marzola. Yes. Assemblyman O'Neill. Yes. Assemblywoman Tolls. Yes. Chair Howdigy. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Okay, committee members, we can now move on to the next item on our agenda, which is bill hearings. Today, we will be hearing Assembly Bill 152 and Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 1. I will be taking them out of order, and I will start with opening the bill hearing on SCR 1, which urges employers in this state to provide personal protective equipment to employees to prevent the spread of COVID-19. I believe I have Senator Hardy here with us. Welcome to the committee, Senator Hardy. When you are ready, please, you can begin. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate uh, your indulgence. Uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to talk to the assembly um, and particularly the Commerce and Labor Committee. So thank you uh, for allowing us to, uh, to do that. I uh, had the opportunity to uh, present this in the uh, Senate and when the testimony was done, uh, the entire committee uh, requested to be co-sponsors and that's why uh, we have uh, the uh, co-sponsors all included there. This was passed by voice vote because it's a Senate concurrent resolution, number one, as it were, uh, unanimously off the floor of the Senate. So it comes to you in that way. I appreciate uh, Vice Chair Carlton and all of the members of the committee. Appreciate being able to talk to you. The resolution itself addresses the need for businesses uh, who uh, have want to protect their most valuable asset, that is their employees. And even though there are um, debates going on, who's supposed to wear a mask, for instance, who's supposed to do when are they supposed to wear a mask? Do they really have to? The reality is we still have COVID-19. It still is infectious. It still has uh, the ability to uh, make people very sick, in fact, make people die. And so this bill will urge and in hopefully inspire people to continue to be vigilant and to protect their employees. Um, and so the the masks have become almost the new socks or the ties, and you see uh, people doing different kinds of statements with them. Uh, you go to the gift shop downstairs and you see the Battleborn uh, mask. You see the uh, one that I like the best uh, uh, with the state seal, and it fits me better than anything else. And I've got a lanyard now, so it's never far from me and I can put it on and, and take it off and not lose it. So when you get as old as I am, it's good to have something tied to you. Uh, the face shields are interesting because they're, uh, technically speaking, they're personal protective equipment, uh, but you can get them in all shapes and sizes. This one I got uh, in Truckee uh, during the last special session, and they they all make a statement. My Son-in-law makes one that uh, is cute, and I've got a son that's made over a thousand that he gives out. We have become a culture of face masks and personal protective equipment. Obviously, we're familiar with the uh, hand uh, washing stations at every store that we go into now, and uh, the construction industry has started off with the N95s and now it's become commonplace to see a good N95 mask wherever you go. Uh, I will point out also the uh, interesting fact that people talk about knotting their face mask and that will allow them to have a tighter fit on the face mask. So those are all things that uh, we see and employers will have an opportunity to protect their employees. Now, Texas just recently said, you don't really need to wear face masks. And um, so what happened when you take off a mandate, as it were, their people uh, become more comfortable and they say, well, I don't need to. But bottom line is you still have to avoid getting sick. You still have to avoid getting other people sick. So in Texas, even though they took off the uh, protocols, the mandated protocols, General Motors, Toyota, Target, and Macy's all said, we want to continue to protect our employees. So this uh, Senate concurrent resolution one is designed to continue and to urge our employers to protect our employees. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And I know we have OSHA people, uh, Victoria Carrion, I know, is here and uh, I don't know if you would like to have her speak, uh, but Shannon um, is here with us uh, from uh, the OSHA or the, the State Labor Commission. Uh, Shannon Chambers is here if you would like to hear from her. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Senator Hardy. And I did see that they have registered. Um, were they part of the presentation or were they just here to answer any questions that committee members may have? I think Shannon was uh, registered, and uh, but they are able to answer any questions and they, they serve at your pleasure, as do I. Okay, thank you. And I think we can we can go to the committee. Committee members, um, do you have any questions for our presenter or commissioner chambers? And we also have the Division of Industrial Relations on the line to answer questions as well. Okay, I don't see anyone with questions, Senator Hardy. So we are gonna go ahead and move into testimony and support. And I do see that I have um, Commissioner Chambers signed up to give testimony and support. Commissioner, are you with us? Good afternoon. This is Shannon Chambers, the Nevada Labor Commissioner. Um, for the record, uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the Assembly, Commerce and Labor Committee, Shannon Chambers testifying in support of Senate Concurrent Resolution Number One. We will make every effort to communicate this to Nevada employers and thank Senator Hardy for bringing it to the committee. Thank you, Commissioner Chambers. I'm broadcasting. Can we check the telephone line to see if there's anyone wishing to testify in support? Testify in support of SCR1. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. And I don't have anyone signed up to testify in opposition virtually. So can we move to the telephone line to see if there's anyone wishing to um, testify in the opposition? Yes, Chair. To testify in opposition of SCR1, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. I do have uh, Victoria Carrion and Jess Langford with the Division of Industrial Relations on to testify in neutral. We are moving to testimony in neutral. Ms. Carrion, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Victoria Carrion, for the record, I'm the Administrator of the Division of Industrial Relations. Uh, and thank you, Senator Hardy, for bringing this bill. And um, just to clarify that for the committee, our office includes Nevada OSHA, as well as the safety consultation and training section. And so personal protective equipment is actually already required to be provided by employers under 29 CFR 1910.132A. Um, some of the face coverings that Senator Hardy was showing you don't technically qualify as personal protective equipment. However, as face coverings, our OSHA guidance that we have distributed as part of the governor's directives does require employers to provide face coverings. So our safety consultation and training section does provide information out to employers about safety requirements, and we are happy to complement the efforts of this bill by um, providing information over our email list. We have 2,500 members of our SCATS email list that goes out to employers and employees who are interested in safety. We also have access to the Silver Flume database, which has over 32,000 businesses on it. We also have a monthly class that we do on personal protective equipment. That class is totally free. It goes for three hours, and we are happy to advertise all of those things and all of the requirements as a complement to this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carrion. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line to see if there's anyone wishing to testify in neutral? Yes, Chair. To testify in neutral on SCR1, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. 
Senator Hardy, would you like to give any closing remarks? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just appreciate the process that we go through and I recognize that uh, if there's any doubt about protecting your employee or how it is mandated or not mandated, I always want the employer to protect the employee. And I think that's the critical part of this that we just need to not fail to encourage protection for our employees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hardy, and thank you for joining us. I will now close the hearing on SCR1. Our next bill is AB 152. I will open the bill hearing on Assembly Bill 152, which revises provisions re relating to the collection of certain debts. I believe we have Assembly Member Krasner here with us. Welcome to the committee, Assembly Member Krasner. And I believe you have a presenter, Jamie Cogborn, with you as well. Yes. Yes, well, that's correct. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to be here today to introduce AB 152. For the record, I am Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner, representing Nevada State Assembly District 26. I am here to introduce Assembly Bill 152 for your consideration. Assembly Bill 152 imposes certain requirements and restrictions that currently apply to collection agencies or persons who engage in certain activities related to the collection of debts on their own behalf. Here to present the bill is attorney Jamie Cogburn. I do wanna say on the record that I have received phone calls from stakeholders and I am willing to work together with all stakeholders after the presentation of the bill to make this the best legislation possible. So here to present the bill, is Attorney Jamie Cogburn. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. Um, Chair Hadegi, can I move forward with just presenting? Yes, Mr. Cog Cogburn, when you're ready. Thank you. The, the, bill, the, the goal of the bill is to level the playing field for consumers, not only with debt collection companies, but also with original creditors. So under federal law and certain state law, debt collection companies must follow certain guidelines when they're collecting debts. This would expand that law and make where original creditors have to follow the same guidelines. For example, you can't call somebody's employer and harass them to collect the debt, whether you're a debt collector or an original creditor. Um, currently, uh, we're helping a client pro bono that he was laid off during COVID. He has now got a job back and he's laid on some bills uh, throughout that period. And he's getting called at his new employer and they're calling him daily and saying, hey, we need to speak to you about this debt. We need to speak to you about this debt. And obviously that's causing issues with his employer and he doesn't want to lose his job since he just got a new job um, after the COVID uh, or during this period. The other thing it, it, it will do is it will require debt buyers to verify information. So the best example, I can give you a personal one. I have a, a business line of credit that I was renewing a couple of years ago and they run your credit to make sure that you, everything's still fine. And they said, hey, this thing's coming up on your credit that says you owe a pest control company $120. Um, I didn't know what they were talking about. I finally got a hold of the debt collection company after uh, multiple calls and letters. And they said, oh, we have the wrong person. Um, so what the bill will do is require debt buyers to verify the information before they start calling people, sending letters, and definitely before they start suing or reporting on their credit. Um, the bill also has some built-in protections uh, for businesses, whether it's original creditors or debt collectors. Um, one is if a, if a claim is brought not in good faith, then they can recover attorney's fees and costs. The other thing is um, it, re it requires consumers if you're gonna, if you're applying for credit and something material changes such as your employment or your address, then you need to update that creditor um, during that application process. And with that, I would leave it open to any questions or concerns anyone has. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I was still muted. Thank you, Mr. Cogburn and Assembly Member Krasner. I am gonna open it up to questions from the committee. Committee members, um, I'm going to start with Assemblymember Considine. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner, for, for bringing this bill. Um, I see that there are uh, some suggested amendments, but my question right now is the, the changes to this, to this bill, will this help protect seniors who are often um, victims of um, original creditors, debt, collect, debt collectors, fraudulent callers um, who are continuously harassed for debts they may not even owe? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to allow presenter attorney Jamie Cogburn to address all questions, concerns, or comments, please. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Woman Considine, to answer your question in short, for the most part, it does. Um, you, you listed a lot of different things. The, the one thing that it will do is, whether it's a senior or anybody, um, but especially for a senior, seniors are, are, have certain exemptions under the law so if their only income is social security um, and other things like that, they're exempt from creditors, meaning a creditor can't get a judgment and collect on them because basically those are, essentially they came from government funds. So those funds are exempt and they can't garnish their wages or not wages, but their bank account and things like that. Um, the one thing this bill does not do um, is stop the, the calls that we all get that we don't know where they come from. Um, I, I don't know if there's a way to do that on a state level. Um, I know the FTC is looking at things, but I, I get a call nearly every day to sign up for solar um, and I already have solar. So I don't know why they keep calling me, but, and I know, have no idea who's calling. Um, every time I answer the phone, they hang up. But if I don't answer, I get a message, but it does, the, the bill does protect um, the elderly and people that are vulnerable. And it also clarifies the, the law that we already have uh, in Nevada, it basically explicitly states all the things that are not allowed um, rather than just referencing the federal statute. Um, so the federal statute originally came out in 1977 and went into effect in 1978. So we're, we're looking at 43 years ago. This bill um, clarifies all the different techniques and things that have happened over the years that um, have created some loopholes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Assembly Member Considine. And Mr. Cogburn and Ms. Krasner, I have had a few requests from the committee, so I'm gonna ask them, is it possible, because I know there was the um, bill that was introduced and then also an amendment that was provided making changes. Can you walk us through the amendment? Yes. Um, Chair Hadi, yeah, I can. The, and I'll, I'll just back up one, one bit. The, the original bill went into Chapter 649, which governs only debt collection companies. And um, the, the proposal is to create a whole new chapter because it's very hard to modify that chapter that only applies to debt collection companies because most of that chapter, other than two provisions of it, are for licensing of debt collection companies. Um, and it would make it, would make it very difficult it was unclear and it would make it very onerous for original creditors such as banks or credit card companies and things like that to have to comply with a statute that's really meant for debt collection companies. So the amendment was to create its own chapter, make it very crystal clear what is allowed, what is not. Debt collection companies will still have their licensing requirements as required under NRS 649 and banking institutions and other financial institutions will still have their same requirements as they always have. Um, it would just uh, create a new chapter that says, hey, you, you have to follow certain guidelines um, when you're collecting a debt, which are basically what's in the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act. And could you, could you explain to me the difference between a, a, a collection agency and a debt collector? Yes. Uh, Sure, how to get the, uh, they're kind of in, interchangeable. A debt, a debt collector, the new definition of the debt, debt collector in, in this proposed amendment would be anybody that's collecting a debt that's in default. So any, if you're laid on a credit card statement, whether you're the original creditor or a collection company. And then, but the, in practice, a debt collector is a, a, a company that purely all they do is collect debts. So if I have a, an account with T-Mobile, 
I shut down my phone, I don't pay my bill, they may ultimately send that to a collection company that will try to collect that debt. Um, within that arena, there are also what's called debt buyers that um, are usually larger companies that buy what they call tranches of debt, millions and millions of dollars of, of bad debt, and they try to go collect that. So they buy it for pennies on the dollar and try to collect whether it's 10 cents, 50 cents, whatever it may be on that, and that's their business model. And that's where the verification process that I spoke about earlier comes into play that debt collectors would now have to verify when they are assigned a, a collection. Hey, this is the right person we're calling. This is the right uh, person we're suing and things like that before they report it on their credit or sue them. Okay, so then the debt, a debt collector would be the, the original person who issued the loan as well as anyone who they sold the collection of the debt to. That is correct. And, and under this statute, it would be. And then uh, you have the original creditor, there, which, which grants credit. So I apply with Bank of America. They give me a, a loan. They're the original creditor. But if my loan went into default, they could be considered a debt collector under this statute if they're trying to collect that debt when it's in default. Committee members, any other questions? Assembly member Tolls? Thank you, Chair. And uh, following along with the same lines of, of the Chair, um, I appreciated that, res that clarification. Um, so if I understand you correctly, you know, we, it made the most sense because a, in this case, a debt collector could be a bank or um, as opposed to a collection agency. And so we needed to create a, its own separate chapter to apply these um, regulations around conduct, you know, to make sure that they were um, approaching the individual, like the example you said, verifying information before contacting them um, not harassing them or recording or any of those activities that would be otherwise prohibited for collection agencies. Um, so just want to make sure I understood you correctly. What impact does this have to put it under the, um, you know, the uh, deceptive trade practices um, versus putting it under, let's say, a banking chapter or some other um, original um, debtor chapter? Assemblywoman Tolls, I appreciate that question. It's a, it's a very good question. The, the the original idea was, hey, to just, original creditors are gonna have to follow the same rules when collecting the debt as a debt collector. The problem with putting it under the debt collection or collection agency statute is all the, all the uh, licensing regulations, which the majority of that statute covers. There's essentially two provisions under that statute that cover what you can and cannot do. And they really just reference um, the federal law for debt collectors, which is the Federal Debt Collection Practice Act. Um, you could put it under a banking statute, I assume, but then I think you might run into the same issues for debt collection companies. They would, they would then have to follow certain banking licensing regulations. The thought for the deceptive trade practice is under Chapter 598, um, and I, I do not have it in front of me, so I apologize, the first one is the deceptive trade, but then there's 598A, B, C, and D. And I want to say C and D are uh, one's an unfair trade, one is a, a consumer reporting statute. And so they kind of fall in that category of consumer protection statutes. And that was my only uh, rationale for putting it there. Thank you. Follow up, Chair. Yes, Assembly Member, go ahead. Thank you, and I, I know looking at the uh, amendments that um, you provided, and I printed out a copy of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, um, and so I know in NRS 649.370 for collection agencies, it just refers to the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, um, and I presume that, that that makes it easiest just because if for some reason that gets updated, then we automatically presume that gets updated and we don't have to keep going back to NRS statute. Are you hoping to put all of this language, which is quite lengthy, into a new chapter or will you also just refer um, 
under the deceptive trade practices, the definitions around a debt collector, and then just reference that um, it will, you know, meet the the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act to mirror the language. I guess is what I'm looking for. Yes, uh, the answer is both. So there is a provision that, and I, I apologize, I do not have it directly in front of me. That does say, hey. Um, we're referencing the Federal Debt, Federal Fair Debt Collection Practice Act, um, but the Fair, the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act was drafted back in 1977, so there has not been a lot of changes or amendments. I think the last amendment was in 2009, if I remember correctly. In, um, in 2010. 2010, and so <laughs> what, I, what I did was I took a lot of the provisions from the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act and then ultimately took some provisions from other states that have, at, have passed a similar law that just clear, make it a little bit clearer um, to be updated with technology. And other things where, um, for example, the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act, because it's a federal statute, in, if you're in the second circuit court, they may say, hey, we interpret it this way because stuff is unclear. If you're in the ninth circuit, we may interpret this way. So this would, clarify that, make it clear, this is what the, the rules are for Nevada, and um, these are the protections allowed in Nevada. The, the other thing that the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act does not have that this one does have is the, the debt buyer provision where they have to verify the debt. So that is, that is actually not from uh, the, the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act. Much of those provisions are from uh, case law that has come out of the Fair Debt Collection Practice Act and from other states that have passed similar laws. And then I believe Assembly Member Duran had a question. You just answered my question. It was concerning uh, verifying the person, if it was um, who that person may be. There may be 5B Durans in there, so they kind of have to go after the, the right one. But I, can I have a follow-up question though with that? So if they have the wrong person, how do they? How does that person clear her name or get off that um, collection or their credit? It ruins their credit score. How would they? How would that happen? How would that be fixed with this? Thank you, Assembly Woman Duran. They would go through the process of the, they would dispute the debt with the collection company and they can dispute the debt with the credit bureaus that it's reporting on. So if they have proof that um, it's not theirs, the example I gave earlier was I had a collection from a pest control company that I, I haven't used. I sent them proof. Um, little did I know there was another Jamie Cogburn out there that um, they were reporting this on, but I guess they were, and uh, they removed it. Sometimes that can be harder than other times. There's no doubt about that. But the, the hope is of the bill is that up front, the original creditor, if they assign it to a debt collection company, has to provide the verification paperwork um, and, and things like that. So all that stuff can be verified and you hope that you won't have very many of these problems. So you're trying to eliminate the problem before it actually occurs is really the hope of it. Thank you. And Assembly Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just want to make sure that I understand um, one of the terms that's actually included in the amendment. It's uh, under the definition of consumer debt and consumer credit, um, a consumer credit transaction. So what is that transaction? And I'll, I'll just let you know what I'm getting at is, does this apply to landlords? Wow, you stumped me, Vice Chair Carlton. I get one. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I'm out. Um, the, the definition as it stands, it, it, that is a good question, and it probably needs some clarification. A consumer credit transaction would be for 
anything that's consumer related, including mortgage debt. Um, I, I honestly did not think about landlord tenant in that aspect, but the way the, the bill is written, I think it would. Um, so it could be defined, uh, meaning obviously in a landlord tenant uh, situation, many times there's an eviction process, but if they were to try to collect the remaining debt outside of the eviction, um, they would still have to abide by these laws. Um, but it, it's meant to cover any consumer transaction. So it would not cover, uh, I work at a law firm, it would not cover if my law firm uh, defaulted on a copier purchase, but it would if, if it was a personal computer that I bought for myself and I didn't pay the bill and ultimately went into collections. I hope that answers the question. And, and thank, thank you, Mr. Cogburn. When I saw mortgage, it, it piqued my curiosity. So, um, and we've all heard stories of what's going on. So I'm just curious if this would apply. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Carlton. And I, I just had a quick question, just, just for my knowledge, Mr. Cogburn. If we go to section, Leave it is. Let me see. Section thirty-four, where it's referencing um, the statute of limitations expiring. What is the statute of limitations? How long is that period? Chair sure, Hadegi, it is one year from the date of the violation. So that mirrors the federal law. Um, other states have expanded that to three years, um, but. As it stands under federal law, it's one year from the violation. The committee members, any other questions? Okay, assembly member tolls. Thank you for the, the final follow-up. I just think um, perhaps it would be helpful in distinguishing which parts of the amendment come from the um, Fair, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and which ones come from court cases and which ones come from other states. Could you perhaps put together, put that into a table or a chart for us so that we can distinguish what are we adding from federal law versus what are we adding from other, um, you know, model language? And, um, and then the last piece that I didn't really get to is what are we excluding? You mentioned licensing as one of the reasons why we're putting this over in um, deceptive trade practices versus under the debt um, debt collection chapter. Are there anything? Is there anything else that we're excluding? So, like the licensing requirements and other regulations that we don't want to apply to this category. And you don't have to answer that here. I just think perhaps some follow up that um, all of us could benefit from uh, that analysis would help us break down this this lengthy um, amendment. Thank, thank you. And Mr. Cogburn, if you put um, that together, if you could please just provide it to our committee manager so that she can make sure that everyone on the committee gets it. Yes, Chair. Okay. Committee members, we'll last call. Any further questions? Okay, I'm going to move into testimony um, in support. I believe I have Peter Aldis signed up to provide testimony in support. Doesn't look like he's on. Broadcasting, can we move to the telephone line? Yes, Chair. To testify in support of AB 152, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 193. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Again, caller with the last three digits of 193. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. You can press star six to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Hello. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Aldous, B-E-T-E-R-A-L-D-O-U-S. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for this opportunity. I'm a staff attorney at Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada, and I specialize in bankruptcy and debt collection. I support AB 152 both as originally introduced and with the proposed amendments, and I am grateful for the opportunity to, to testify on this legislation. Debt and debt collection are frequently discussed in moral terms. The thinking is that those who borrow money but later cannot repay it are dishonest or fraudulent. My experience has been the opposite. Clients come to me ashamed and stressed out because they've done everything in their power to repay their debt. I'm their last resort, not their first stop. Debt collectors, whether third party or working directly for the creditor, have made my clients' lives unbearable because they use a broad range of manipulative tactics to extract what little my clients have left. AB 152 does not outlaw debt collection. It merely imposes uniform guidelines on debt collectors to ensure they maintain a minimum level of respect for the debtor they're trying to collect from. It also standardizes the requirement that all debt collectors be accountable for the accuracy of the information they use when collecting debt. A seemingly minor error in the identity of a debtor or the amount of a debt can cause extreme stress in the person the debt collector is attempting to collect the debt from, and it's vital that there be a straightforward way for disputes to be resolved quickly. The events of the past year have thrust thousands of Nevadans into financial uncertainty through no fault of their own. With businesses closed or restricted and unemployment surging, incomes have dropped precipitously. Despite the best efforts of Dieter, unemployment assistance came too late or not at all for many Nevadans, and basic necessities like food and housing have been unaffordable for many who were previously financially secure. It will take years for the after effects of the COVID-19 pandemic to shake out, and a complete recovery will take even longer. The incredible stress so many Nevadans have been living with will continue as they try to rebuild their financial lives and the stress of abusive debt collection will slow that recovery and compound the emotional toll. No one chose to lose their job or reduce their income due to COVID and its related shutdowns, and no one should suffer abuse at the hands of debt collectors because their finances were destroyed by forces outside their control. The COVID-19 pandemic isn't the only source of involuntary crippling debt. The vast majority of medical debts are not incurred by choice. When a client comes to me because they can't afford their medical debts, they haven't been irresponsible, they've had bad luck. Their treatments frequently come at astronomical costs with no regard for their ability to repay the debt. The added stress that comes with medical debt makes recovery harder both physically and emotionally. Without fundamental changes to the economics of healthcare, medical debt will continue to haunt Nevadans and this bill will help protect those who are Carlton, suffering the most. We appreciate yes. you calling in to testify and support. It sounds like you, had, you have um, remarks that you have written down. If you would provide those to our committee manager, that way she can make sure to share them with the committee. I, think I will do that. Thank you. Broadcasting, Thank you. do we have anyone else on the telephone signed up to testify in support? Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. Can we check the telephone line for those who are wishing to testify in opposition? Yes, Chair. To testify in opposition of AB 152, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in opposition of AB 152, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Okay, thank you. I don't see anyone signed up to testify in neutral virtually. Can we check the telephone line? See if there's anyone wishing to testify in the neutral position? Yes, Chair, to testify in neutral of AB 152, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you wish to testify in neutral of AB 152, press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 626, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe in. Good afternoon, chairs and member for the record. My name is Rob Wilson, R-O-B. 
W-I-L-S-O-N from the Nevada Credit Union League. Just want to briefly thank the author for willingness to uh, meet with all stakeholders and the sponsors of the Nevada Credit Union League. Uh, slightly concerned there may be some unintended consequences with the proposed language and how it may impact our current federal and state statutes regulations that our credit unions must follow. We very much look forward to reviewing the language with our members and sharing that feedback with the author and the committee uh, just by way of uh, mentioning Nevada credit unions have gone out of their way to help their members through this pandemic uh, by offering forbearances on mortgages, working with members on credit card and auto loans. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, on this bill today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Broadcasting, do we have any other callers on the line wishing to testify in neutral? Yes, Chair. Sure. Caller with the last three digits of 802. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Uh, good afternoon. Tim Myers with the Nevada Collectors Association. It's T I M M Y E R S. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Mr. Myers. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. I consider this an honor as it is the first time in my 55 years of life that I've got to participate in legislation. I'm speaking today in the capacity of president of the Nevada Collectors Association. The Nevada Collectors Association is comprised of about 30 licensed collection agencies all located within the state of Nevada. We are not debt buyers. We are completely different than a debt buyer, but rather professionally licensed brick and mortar agencies who employ Nevadans, who are consumers, who are voters, and work on behalf of Nevada businesses. I want to thank Assemblyman Kras Assemblywoman Krasner for the sponsor and for the sponsors for agreeing to work with our industry on this bill. This morning, we received 11 pages of new language, so we are reviewing the draft language and determine how it might impact our industry. We feel there also is some concern with the language and how it's written. Because of this, we are currently neutral on the bill and have pledged to work closely with Assemblywoman Krasner to address any concerns we may have. We would like some time to do so. Again, I want to thank the chair, the committee, for me to speak today. I would like to also express, we too were personally hit by COVID. We were completely shut down March 17th and told not to collect by our governor, which hurt all of our employees. We laid off 47 employees who all have debt and have to pay their bills and went on unemployment. So it does directly affect us as well. So when you come after 649 and you go debt collections and credit debtor, debtors and you're going after the consumers, one major concern would be would, as licensed collection agencies were regulated by the FID and we pay for licensing, have to do the same in order to be regulated under this law. That's one of the concerns and, and then just there's others that we would just, like I said, we'd like to have. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling in for being a part of the process. And I'd just like to remind everyone on the line that neutral means you're not taking a position on the, the bill. You're not neither opposing it or supporting it as well. Thank you for calling in, though, Mr. Myers, and we appreciate you being a part of the process. And if you do have written remarks, please feel free to share them with our committee manager. Thank you very much. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line to see if there's anyone else signed up? Testify in neutral. Yes, Chair. Well, the caller with the last three digits of 725, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, this is Andrew McKay. I'm the executive director of the Nevada Franchise Auto Dealers Association. Um, 
briefly, uh, the reason why we are uh, speaking to you in the neutral position uh, with respect to AB 152 as drafted, uh, we were perfectly fine with. And then it was brought to my attention. And in full transparency, haven't had the, the, the complete time to digest all of the language in the proposed amendment. Uh, but it is our understanding that there could be um, uh, some consequences where we may be caught up in that. I don't know if that's the case or not, uh, but I would be remiss. Uh, Assemblywoman Krasner did reach out to me, uh, and uh, we're going to work on it and make sure if there's uh, any unintended consequences with respect to our member dealers that we will uh, we will address those. So appreciate the uh, committee's time and indulgence. And again, uh, thank you to the Assemblywoman uh, for uh, reaching out to me. Thank you, Mr. McKay. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line? Yes, Sharon. Caller with the last three digits of 131. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Connor Kane, C O N N O R C A I N. And I'm testifying in, in neutral today on behalf of the Nevada Bankers Association. Um, I'll try, try not to be repetitive, but but I do want to echo uh, Robert with uh, uh, the credit unions and, and just say that during the pandemic, I think the banks are really proud of the work they've done uh, to, to assist their customers and communities. Uh, they've also been waiving fees and penalties, deferring loan payments, offering mortgage forbearances, um, participating in, in the, the federal PPP program where they have been lending their own money uh, to help keep, keep business in, businesses in Nevada afloat. Uh, I, I also would like to say that uh, and thank the bill sponsor, who we've had a number of conversations with about AB 152, and she's been willing to work through some of the technical questions that we have on our end. Uh, banks are highly regulated, subject to federal and state oversight that is uh, specific to depository institutions. Uh, for example, multiple, multiple regulatory agencies, including the OCC, FDIC, and CFPB, monitor the performance of banks with respect to all aspects of their operations, including debt collection, and their collection activities are subject to similar prohibitions. Uh, on unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts and practices under the federal UDAP law. Our, our technical questions are, are centered around ensuring AB 152 doesn't create any conflicts uh, or confusion for banks between state and federal law, similar to what, what Robert uh, mentioned. Um, and, and we're hopeful that the sponsor, again, based on some of our recent conversations, will help us uh, achieve that critical clarity. Um, I, I do want to say, all that being said, you know, we, we have not been contacted to this point by the proponents, um, and we're only alerted to the length of the amendment um, last night, which really didn't give us much time to, to, to review uh, what we were going to discuss today. And given that these changes are highly technical, we would really, really, really appreciate improved communication moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line? Chair, there are no more callers for neutral at this time. Thank you, broadcast. Assembly member Krasner, would you like to give any closing remarks and Mr. Cogburn? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I will now close the hearing on Assembly Bill 152. Members, the last item on our agenda is public comment. While I give those listening over the internet time to call in to voice public comment, I'm just gonna do some quick public comment housekeeping. I would like to remind those present and listening that the period for public comment is an opportunity to discuss general matters that fall within the purview of this committee. The public has already been given time to support or oppose specific legislation. We open and close hearings on bills so that we establish a record of the public testimony on that bill. Therefore, public comment is not intended to be a continuation of a bill hearing. I'd like to remind everyone that we may limit public comment to two minutes. And please remember to please be respectful of committee members and other witnesses. Do not comment on testimony provided by other speakers and do not make personal attacks. And you may always submit written remarks or inclusion in the meeting record. Broadcasting, do we have anyone on the line for public comment? To take your place in public comment, please press star nine now to join the queue. Chair, 
The public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Thank you. Thank you, committee members. Our next meeting will be on Monday at 1.30, and that concludes our meeting for today. We are adjourned.